with their harrowing, naturalist, and stripped-down aesthetics. The three films within Roberto Rossellini's trilogy of neorealist war films stand out beyond their filmic values, together fitting as humanist documents of an era of utmost devastation. A film movement depicted by realist-driven tales of the poor and the working class. The films of the Italian neorealist movement all shared similar qualities. These films were shot on location, utilised non-professional actors, and often explored themes of the economic and moral conditions of post-war living. Acting as a reflection on the collective Italian psyche, few films in this era made an impact on the national consciousness quite like the three films in Rossellini's trilogy. The films Rome Open City, Paisan, and Germany Year Zero are all immensely potent works of vast thematic complexity and historical accuracy. Featuring casts of predominantly non-professional actors, there is a prominent tangibility and grounded nature to Rossellini's worlds. This seeps through to his bold storytelling approaches and desolate landscapes, helping to pave the way for the birth of modern cinema entirely. È tanto che non mi confesso che ho quasi vergogna. No. Non me lo lasci di Don Pietro. Non sento che ho vissuto male, che ho fatto tante cose che non dovevo fare. Ma che credete che non mi vergogno di andare all'altare in queste condizioni? Ma voi non mi potete capire, Don Pietro. Sono cose che uno fa senza pensarci. Set during the German occupation of Italy in the Second World War, Roberto Rossellini's harrowing international breakthrough Rome Open City, sought to portray the nation's Nazi occupation and in turn create palpable heroes of those brave few who struggled against it. Choosing to utilise regular citizens as opposed to actors, Rossellini's film has the necessary sense of urban power and visceral intensity one would assume of a neorealist work. Here Rossellini focuses on the central tale of resistance leader Giorgio Manfredi. The film follows him and those fellow resistant members around him as they continue to be chased by the Nazis, constantly seeking refuge and searching for a way of escape. In an example of this reflective resistance at the heart of Rossellini's film, in this iconic sequence we see Anna Magnani's Pina, who sees Francesco be thrown into a truck with other arrestees and taken away. As she soon attempts to break through a barrier of police and run towards him, she is shot dead. Captured perfectly by Magnani's fiery performance, this small scene encapsulates the entire essence of what makes neorealist cinema so powerful. Like in any essence of filmic romanticism, Rossellini shoots the shocking death of his protagonist like a documentary, absent of close-ups and in a banal fashion, showcasing the unpredictable and deplorable consequences of the war. French director Jean-Luc Godard famously said, all roads lead to Rome open city. With this statement, Godard seems to harmonize the belief that everything we understand and know regarding modern cinematic conventions and realism are as a debt to that of the neorealist movement and specifically to Rome Open City. It is easy to see the clear influence of Rossellini's film on the succeeding history of cinema, for this is a truly authentic and timeless filmic experience in every sense of the word. Rossellini's choice to shoot his film on these worn and rural streets allows us to become entrenched in their clear societal deterioration as well as the visual sense of poverty and struggle was evidently present during this troubled time, deservedly garnering numerous awards around the globe and sparking life into the newly established movement of neorealist cinema. Rome Open City represented a distinct cinematic and historical moment, one of the rare examples of cinema where a film itself spoke to the hopes and dreams of an entire nation when they needed it most. In the 
the second chapter of the War Trilogy, director Roberto Rossellini follows up his location-specific breakout with a story that's spread across the entire nation, the scope-driven vehicle, Paisan. Channeling a more documentary approach, Rossellini's wartime tale consists of six episodes, all set during the liberation of Italy at the end of World War II, set across the entire country and featuring a vast array of people. These near-realist tales of liberation can be traced from the south and north of Italy, and despite being vastly different conceptually, are all tied together by their shared desire to each replicate tactile reality, with Rossellini's camera itself appearing to stimulate this illusion of captured authenticity. Switching from the somewhat melodramatic and narrative-centric focus of Rome Open City, here Rossellini chooses to structure his episodic stories with a stylistic blend of documentary technique and juxtaposed fiction. Here we can observe this stylistic approach being applied by Rossellini, identifying that this lack of an overexpressive technique is deliberate and structurally considered. Taking place in the film's sixth and final episode, we see the contrasting treatments of the protected American officers and the Italian partisans who were not protected by the Geneva Conventions and international law for humanitarian treatment in war. With their hands tied behind their backs, the Italians are seen here being forced into the river with a sign that reads partisan. One of the American officers, horrified by this, races to try and help, but is quickly shot dead by the Germans. Similar in tone and approach to the penis scene from Rome Open City, this sequence confronts its bleak reality head on and without comfort. It is crucial in showcasing the unity between two separate entities who each share an identical enemy. Sticking to his near-realist desires to once again feature a cast of non-professionals, Rossellini succeeds in grounding his film with an aura of authenticity and harrowing realism, due largely in part to his stylistic shift, which results in another immense and powerful near-realist tale. It is this realism in Paisan that binds Rossellini's cinematic vision together. We can't help but become engulfed in this torn world. Rossellini garners immense sympathy from his audience for these people living amongst the chaos as we struggle to watch them try to survive in the most extreme of circumstances. Germany Year Zero, the final chapter of Rossellini's war trilogy, is perhaps the most harrowing and tragic of all his post-war neorealist examinations, presenting a captivating and naturalist portrait of a war-torn Berlin. Rossellini's film offers its downbeat and apocalyptic world through the eyes of a 12-year-old boy named Edmund. Edmund lives in a worn-down apartment building, caring for his sick father and sharing a room with his two older siblings. As we follow him on his various unsupervised travels, he soon comes under the influence of a Nazi sympathising ex-teacher. Having just confessed to his teacher regarding the murder of his father, here we observe the disturbed Edmund as he wanders through the ruins of this ally-occupied Berlin. Shot here in a contemplative close-up, this scene is quite unlike any other at portraying the turmoil and deterioration of the war. As we witness the desolate streets and the scattered rubble, 
the visceral and tangible nature of Rossellini's world is emphasised to a heightened degree. Encountering a group of boys playing football after being rejected upon his wish to join in, Edmund continues on. Filmed in this tragically powerful wide shot, he wanders on alone in the street, and ultimately on to his inevitable fate. When compared to other historically notable film movements, such as the French New Wave and the German Expressionist movement, one can identify Italian neorealism as a movement that pushed aesthetic and visual attributes to the side in favour of practicality and ethical signalling. This noteworthy desire to capture art with instinct, civility, and authenticity is something clearly present at the heart of all neorealist cinema, and also at the foundation of Germany Year Zero. In presenting his central coming-of-age figure with a lack of romanticism and sentimentality, Rossellini instead lends despair to the boy's tale, charting the truthful and tragic reality that is faced by many children of war. Intricate in both its explorations of perversion and fascism, Rossellini's gut-wrenching work is one that echoes on long after its final frame, fitting as one of the most powerful cinematic perspectives on this war-ravaged world. When viewing the extent of Rossellini's three films, within the context of his own career and within the neorealist movement, one can identify his clear authorship and cinematic vigour, which although subtle, acts in unison with the necessities of his artistic pursuits and his thematic earnestness. Crafted with empathy and truth, Rossellini's films were quite unlike any other. In both stylistic pursuit and technical dexterity, whether it be in the resistance-led tragedy of Rome Open City, the collective war time capsule of Paisan, or the coming-of-age devastation of Germany Year Zero, these films are examples that fittingly embody the art of neorealism and change the way the world thought of cinema entirely. Conceived and captured as cries of pain and anguish for both the Italian people and for those united and ravaged by war, the three films that make up Roberto Rossellini's monumental crowning filmic achievement plunge us deep into concrete worlds of horror, humanity, and history.